Thanks, John. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's great to be back. And uh, I've been uh, enjoyed coming to Spokane for a while uh, with KSPS during pledge time. And it's fun to drop by the campus here and share some ideas about travel with you. A lot of times when I give talks, as I have for the last 30 years, I'll talk about budget skills. You know, how do you pack light? How do you catch the train? What about a B&B &B or a youth hostel, this sort of thing? And uh, when I look back on 30 years of teaching, uh, you know, I wrote my first book in 1980. It was Europe Through the Back Door. It could have been called European Travel Cheap. And the whole thing was just how do you stretch your budget? And that was my thing. And then the next decade, the 90s, I was all about, uh, I wrote a book called Europe 101, History and Art for Travelers. And it was all about appreciating art and culture and cuisine and the fine wine and all the beautiful uh, things that you'll experience in Europe. And then in the last decade, my passion for teaching has been how do we broaden our perspectives through travel? I wrote this book, Europe, as a political act. So I didn't have a big plan, but when you think about it, it was first Europe through the back door, budget skills, then Europe 101, appreciate the history and the art, and then travel as a political act, how to broaden your perspective to bring home that souvenir of a, of a world viewpoint. And uh, you've probably all heard of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, where first you cover your, your basic things, and then you get more self-fulfillment and altruism and so on. It's the same kind of uh, evolution, I think. And I want to talk tonight about that, that ultimate sort of prize. How do we broaden our perspective through travel? And wherever you're traveling, this can be your challenge and your goal. The choice is yours. A year ago, today, I was in, well not today, but a year ago for Christmas and New Year's, I was in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Mexico City. Not because they're comfortable places to travel, but because I had an opportunity to go down there and just check out what's happening. And with the proper, or with the, with the, with the unique kind of perspective, that's a big joy, and I want to talk about that. I've spent a third of my adult life, four months a year for the last 30 years, living out of a 9 by 22 by 14 inch carry on the airplane size suitcase. And when I look back on it, it's been time and money very well spent. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I love the opportunity to go experience our world. Now, as a travel writer, my goal is to bring home the magic and help people, you know, inspire people and equip people so they can go over there and really have the most rewarding trip. And there's a lot of dimensions to travel that can be magic. You can gain an appreciation of nature. We've got wonderful nature here. The cool thing about Europe's nature, and my, my beat really is Europe, so a lot of my anecdotes come from Europe. My, uh, the great thing about experiencing and enjoying nature in Europe is it's so accessible. I mean, you know, these people look pretty rugged, but they rode the lift up for breakfast, all right? There's a, there's a revolving restaurant on top of the mountain. Now, my idea of a good day in Switzerland is to ride the lift up for breakfast, get to the top without any sweat, it's still early in the morning, and then spend three or four hours walking on a ridge like that, like tight roping on a ridge. On one side, you got lakes stretching all the way to Germany. On the other side, you got the most incredible alpine panorama anywhere, the Eigermonk and Jungfrau. And ahead of you, you hear the long, legato tones of an Alphorn announcing that the helicopter stocked mountain hut is open, it's just around the corner, and the coffee schnapps is on. All right, see, <laughs> that's a beautiful experience. And it, you know, in many, many ways when you travel, you just gain an appreciation for this beautiful world that we call home. Also, when you travel, you gain an appreciation for culture. Now, for 25 years, I was a tour guide, and I found that a lot of my tourists, my American tourists, were a subconsciously anyways, offended by somebody who was enthusiastic about something they didn't know you could be enthusiastic about. It was like, are you telling me you're better than us? Are you, are you, are you saying I'm a bumpkin? Now, when I go to Europe, I've always just felt like it's show and tell, and it's their turn. You remember in third grade, show and tell? That kid's not better, he just got a new toy and he's showing it to you, right? Well, they're not better, they just are evangelical about cheese. <laughs> I was raised thinking cheese is no big deal. It's orange and the shape of the bread. Sandwich. <laughs> and then you go into these cheese shops in Paris and it's like a festival of mold. <laughs> There's a different cheese for every day of the year. And I, I don't know if you saw our show, but I love it when a, a, a friend of mine in Paris who runs a restaurant, she takes me shopping in the morning. And we go into this cheese shop, and she picks up a moldy wad of goat cheese and takes a deep whiff. Rick, smell this cheese. It smells like the feet of angels. <laughs> <laughs> she, 
she thinks stinky cheese smells like the feet of angels. All right. Now, you can either be turned on by that or you can go, well, to each his own, you know. And, but you go home and at least you realize some people are really into the art of cheese. That's a beautiful thing. A great thing about travel is it makes history real. I got a degree at the University of Washington in European history accidentally. I had gone to so much Europe and I just loved to go to classes in school and, and learn about all this stuff. And I woke up in the dorm one morning, I remembered it. So I've got seven classes under my belt for history. Three more classes and I'm a historian. <laughs> Let's just finish it off, you know. Uh, but history for me was just fun because we're part of it. It's a fascinating story. It, it makes things more meaningful. It explains things. So much of what's going on in our country today, a historian can go, well, yeah. That's what happens when this is there and that's that. I mean, look what happened over there and back then over there. It's very nice to be connected with the past so you understand the present and you can kind of see where we're going. And a good example of the history when you're in Europe, and this is something I remind my tourists when I'm a tour guide, it's happening today. It's all around us. We're lucky to be there. Open your eyes to it. I was in Berlin on the opening day of their new Reichstag building. Now, this is the historic parliament building. Think our Congress. Bombed out in World War II. Imagine. The last days of World War II were, were fought on the rooftop of this thing with communists fighting Nazis on the rooftop of their Capitol building. And then it was a bombed out Hulk just left in no man's land on the Berlin Wall. And then finally the Cold War is over. Germany is united again. The Capitol goes from Bonn back to Berlin. They need a new Capitol building. What do they do? Well, they don't bulldoze the bombed out building in good European style. They renovate the building with historical roots. They incorporate a modern element into that, a beautiful glass dome. It's open all the time, it's free, it's designed for locals, but tourists are more than welcome to walk up that spiral ramp to get to the very top. And then it's powerful architectural symbolism because this is designed so you can literally, the citizens are, are there to look over the shoulders of their legislators as they're working. The Germans have been really jerked around by their politicians a lot in the last century, and they've decided with this to make a strong statement that you guys are our employees. You're working for us. We're going to keep an eye on you, you see. Now, I was up there on top of that building on opening day, surrounded by teary-eyed Germans. Anytime you're surrounded by teary-eyed Germans, <laughs> something exceptional is going on. <laughs> and it occurred to me, wow, this is the exciting day for those, all of these people, many of those teary eyes old enough to remember when Berlin was bombed flat in the, in the late 40s. Exciting day, the ex symbolic with the opening of this building, the symbolic closing of an ugly chapter in the history of a great nation. No more division, no more communism, no more fascism, a new capital building starting a new century looking into a promising future. Wow, that was exciting. I get excited just talking about it. And I was surrounded by other Americans up there and I looked around and not one of the Americans was, was touched by it. They were clueless. And it saddened me. I just thought, I'm living in a dumbed-down society. These people have been trained not to be engaged, not to be moved, not to be expecting a, a lot of themselves. And I just thought, you know, there's powerful forces in our society that would find it convenient, I believe, if we're all just dumbed down. Just mindless producer-consumers. There's a war going on, just go shopping, it'll be okay. We'll make the decisions, you know? And I thought, no, nope, anytime somebody tells me to just go shopping, red flags are going to go up. And I vowed then and there in my own little world as a travel writer to expect my readers, my viewers, my tourists to be engaged. To expect them to be smart. You make more money if you expect them to be dumb. Especially in tourism. But I want them to be smart. And it just feels good to be engaged. All of us in our own realms cannot put up with dumbing down of our electorate, okay? I think that's really important. And when you travel, I think you can embrace that. One thing fun about travel is you meet people. You meet people you wouldn't normally meet. We live in pretty homogenous worlds. Nothing wrong with it, but I mean, if you look around, we're all very, very much the same. And that's my world at home. When I'm in Europe for a couple of weeks, I meet more interesting people than I meet for the rest of the year at home. Different kind of people. Doesn't need to be earth-shaking experiences, but just different, stimulating encounters. If I'm making a TV show or guiding a tour or making a guidebook or on vacation, and I'm not connecting people to people, it's a flat experience, especially when I'm making my TV shows. If my TV shows are good, they're good to a great degree because I've got friends everywhere in Europe and they'll help me out and I've got real people, real voices. Not a lady in a dirndl sent there by the tourist board at the airport. <laughs> real people, okay? Now when you're traveling, if you're accessible, you'll meet these people. 
Again, they don't need to be earth-shaking experiences, sometimes just goofy stuff. This little kid was staring at me in Italy recently. Finally, his dad said, excuse my son, he stares at Americans. <laughs> and I said, well, what's with that? He said, well, last week we were at McDonald's having our hamburger, and my son, noticing the fluffy white bun, said, Dad, why do Americans have such soft bread? And the dad told his son, because, son, Americans have no teeth. <laughs> Now, I think the dad was just doing what dads do, just entertaining himself as he was out with his son. <laughs> he didn't have any great meaning for that, but the, but the little boy was confused, and I showed him my teeth and did what I could to straighten out that little bit of international misunderstanding. <laughs> when you travel, there's goofy misunderstandings all over the place. I remember visiting my friends in Bulgaria during the Cold War, and they sat me down one night, and they said, now, in America, if everything is private property, how can you go anywhere without trespassing? <laughs> They were very perplexed by this, you see. And it's just, they're victims of their own propaganda, just like we are victims of our, our own propaganda. And when you travel, you're less easy to victimize. One of my favorite places to travel is Ireland. Because in Ireland, I get the sensation that I'm understanding a foreign language. <laughs> <laughs> it would be really nice. And uh, in Ireland, I almost feel that way because people have this wonderful brogue and I wonder, why do they, why is their language so enchanting to me? And I think it's because they speak Gaelic first, and they think and communicate in a Gaelic template, which I would imagine is a more colorful and romantic way to communicate than no-nonsense English. And if you want to hear that Gaelic charm, you go to what, I, uh, what are called Gaeltechs. A Gaeltech in Ireland is a national park for the survival of the traditional culture. In Ireland, even in tough times, the government thinks it's worth a little money to keep the traditional ways alive. Small farms, yeah, let's keep them alive. Speaking the local language, yeah, let's do that, even if it's a little more expensive. And there are places, colored green on the map, on the far west of Ireland, where people speak Gaelic first and English second. You wouldn't know it as a casual tourist, because you walk up to these guys, or people in a shop or whatever, they'll be chatting to each other in Gaelic, they turn to you without missing a beat and speak English, you're gone, they slip back into their Gaelic but they think in terms of Gaelic. So you talk to them and it's this enchanting sort of uh, conversation. And they love to talk. I was talking to these two guys for a while and uh, after a while I asked the guy on the left, were you born here? And he said, no, it was about five miles down the road. <laughs> <laughs> Later on I asked him, have you lived here all your life? He said, not yet. <laughs> I'm just a sucker for that kind of stuff. And after a while, you forget your itinerary. I mean, I've been in Ireland, hitching in the middle of nowhere, whichever direction the cars are coming. I just want to get in the car and talk to somebody. It's so fun to talk with the Irish people. And you get that joy when you travel. The big news in Europe, of course, is the unification of Europe. Ever since 1947, uh, Europe has been moving towards unity. And of course they're in rocky times now, but they've always been in rocky times. And it's a stuttering two steps forward, one step back. But, you know, it's, uh, there's, a, there's a need for Europe to integrate their economies so they don't have a war and so they work together and trade together efficiently. Can you imagine in 1947 when uh, European statesmen got together and uh, in the rubble of a bombed out continent, the second time in their lifetime that, they, that the continent had destroyed itself basically with a horrific war. World War I, World War II. And they said, look, we got to do something or we're going to do this again. This is insane. We need to create a European Union, a United States of Europe, so that our economies are so integrated that we just, it's inconceivable that we would go to war again again. They have little peripheral wars maybe, but Germany and France, that's where you have your real war. That is not going to happen, okay? Now Europe, in spite of all of its foibles, the economy is so interwoven that it's just inconceivable that France and Germany would go at it again as they had so many times in the past. As Europe has united, it's created a Eurozone and a free trade zone. Now, the goal is to compete with the United States. We are a free trade zone of 300 million people producing $15 trillion a year. They are a free trade zone of 400 million people producing $15 trillion a year. Just to put it in perspective, okay? We're less people, they're a little more people, we produce the same. Now a lot of Americans who are inclined to be threatened by Europe's socialism would put down Europe and say, look at these people, they make less money than us. They got all these liberal ideas, you know. Uh, they make less money than us. Well, they do make less money than us, but that's not the full sentence. 
They make less money per person, but they choose to work 20% less hours than we do. And by every measure, they make as much as we do per hour. They're just not working themselves quite so quickly into an early grave. Uh, now they're having a reality check where they actually have to work a little harder. I mean, that's the problem in Greece, is just they're consuming way more than they're producing, and they're retiring when they're 55 years old. It's just not sustainable. And you can't say, would you mind working for another 10 years? They're gonna say, yes, I would, I'm retiring at 55. <laughs> So you have to have this catastrophe they're having now to straighten that out. But when you travel through Europe, you find all sorts of interesting, stimulating, challenging sort of uh, things to observe. I, it's a Tuesday afternoon in, in Holland, and I'm walking down the canal, and I see these men. These are grown men. These are not students. These are men. They should be working, and they're just having a party. And I ask them, what's going on? It's a work day. It's Tuesday afternoon. We play. Uh, you want to come in? No, I'm working, you know. But uh, the Europeans just know how to play. They've got all sorts of interest in, in uh, you know, living, uh, uh, what is it, working to live, not living to work. Uh, and they're, they're very proud about that. Now, of course, they, they work and they produce. They're every bit as invested in their stock market as we are in ours. They just uh, have longer vacations and uh, more uh, entitlements and, and more safeguards and, and all that kind of stuff that we hear about a lot. Now, when you think about what's going on out there and in Europe on the streets and in Occupy Washington and so on, there's going to be a lot of um, chaos, basically, as the societies try to rejigger the wealth to see where it should be. Now, when you look at the demonstrations that are going on in Europe, and you're going to see a lot of them in the future. And I talk about this because I think it's wrong for people not to go to Europe because they think there's going to be riots in the street. Europeans always march. They love to march. It's part of their freedom. They, for me, it's a healthy thing, a manifestation. I've been in Europe in so many million person marches, and if my parents are watching the news, they're thinking I'm in trouble, you know? No, they're just, the teachers are angry, everybody's in support of them. It's a national strike and everybody's marching. Uh, that's what they do. It's, it's too much exercise for most Americans, but uh, <laughs> Europeans march. Now, the, I think the problem in our country and in Europe is we've all conned ourselves into thinking we're wealthier than we are. You know, you had a half million dollar house, suddenly it's worth a million dollars, and then you turn around and it's worth half a million again. You didn't lose half a million dollars. You thought your house appreciated it there, but it never was that valuable anyways. You got accustomed to that, and then it settled back down to reality. You, we need to get our feet on the ground. A third of our graduates from Ivy League, I believe, go into finance. You know, just thinking it's an easy, easy place to score really big money. This is nothing new. I was just standing on the most lavish buildings in all of Europe, 300, 400 years old. These are palaces that are every bit as fancy as Schönbrunn and Versailles. And they were all owned by what they called financiers. You know, hedge fund managers. People with unthinkable wealth didn't know what to do with it, so they buy these Louis XIV style homes and have miles of gardens just to spend their money. Well, this is just an, they had a revolution. Sometimes you have a different way, but you get society out of whack that way, and there's an adjustment. In Europe, they have these lavish entitlements that put ours to shame. In Scandinavia, you get 16 months of paid parental leave to be split any way you like between mom and dad. It's use it or lose it. Most Americans would scoff at that. What are you talking about? You can't have a society where people get to stay home after they have a child. You know, we have family values, but you gotta go right back to work. <laughs> now, I'm not saying one's right or wrong. In fact, I'm really glad I'm running my business here in the United States. It's a much better environment for an entrepreneur like me. But my friends in Europe would not wanna work the way we work. They prefer to work the way they work. They have plenty of opportunity to work, and work hard and get ahead, but it's moderated there, as you might imagine. Now, if you want to look at what's happening in Europe, is they have these lavish entitlements based on the old days when there was a very young society, a lot of people working, not many people living to retirement, and those who do retire with the great promise don't live very long. As long as that's the arrangement, you can sustain it forever. Suddenly, you get really wealthy, you get really well-educated, you get really smart, and you have smaller families. That's what happens when societies get wealthy and educated. Less kids. And then they live longer. They all retire and they live a long time after that. There's not enough kids working to keep the rich people comfortable, right? So what do you gotta do? You gotta tell these people who worked with the promise of a lavish retirement for 30 years, it's different now. We gotta change the rules and you gotta work 10 more years. That's what happened in Greece last year. 
If your friend is one year older than you and they got in and then you got into the same job, you worked just as hard for 30 years, your friend's retired and you got to work 10 more years. That's enough to get you down there burning a Starbucks also. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's going on in Europe. Uh, it's interesting, it's going to be a very tough thing because by the nature of democracy, people don't like a politician who tells them the truth. You know, you, you throw them out and you get a politician that tells you what you want to hear. You don't have to suffer, you don't have to re-figure re it out. You can still rearrange the furniture and all consume more than you produce, you see. So it's a very interesting time and I love watching it. I was just in Europe, I was just in Greece, I was just in Athens, everything's fine over there. Don't not go to Europe because they're in financial crisis and chaos. The, the sky is not falling. You wouldn't want to be a worker there who worked all your life for a retirement because you're not going to have one. But if you're a tourist going over there, have a nice lunch and to see the museum and take a hike, it's, it's better than ever as far as I'm concerned. The big news in Europe is the movement to the east. A few years ago, overnight, basically the whole Warsaw Pact country, the whole Warsaw Pact joined the EU. Suddenly, 100 million new capitalists. The geographical center overnight shifts in Europe from Belgium to the Czech Republic. And in Eastern Europe, it's a festival of pent-up entrepreneurial spirit. It was bleak over there 20 years ago. It was, I remember my early, this is Poland, I remember my early trips to Poland, it was so demoralizing and bleak that because they had this clueless command economy ignoring the laws of supply and demand, people would take their windshield wipers in with them at night. Why? Because somebody forgot to order windshield wipers. Silly as that is, there weren't enough of them and when that happens, what happens? Thieves get wind of it, they steal your wipers and you gotta buy them back for a fortune on the black market. That's what black markets are all about. Controlled, you know, markets. Well now, the law and supply, supply and demand are there and there's plenty of windshield wipers and people leave them on their cars at night. It's exciting to travel around Eastern Europe and, and, and see the enthusiasm they have for their new one freedom and for capitalism. In a lot of ways, they're more capitalistic than their more jaded friends to the West. Also in Europe, you've got this, as Europe is uniting, you've got this interesting struggle with modernity and efficiency and the whole idea when Europe is united is 300 million people have the same coins in their pocket. You can trade across, across borders and you know what gas costs here and what gas costs there. It's quite efficient. It's quite nice, even though it's got problems. Uh, in fact, I should mention, you know, this European Union, the whole idea is uh, uh, economic union is only as strong as its weakest link. And in Europe, there's a base sort of median economy. And if you're wealthier than that, you give more in than you take out. And if you're poorer than that, you get more than you put in. So you have net givers like Germany and, and, uh, and France, and you have net receivers like Portugal, Ireland, and Greece. Now these net receivers were the poorest countries to join the EU. And they're getting all of the goodies. And their currency is locked into basically the German mark, the Euro. And because of that, they can't devalue their society at large or in its entirety. So their false affluence and it rots out and that's what they're dealing with today. It's no coincidence that the three poorest countries that got the most from the European Union to bring them up to snuff, Ireland, Greece and Portugal, are three of the countries that are in the worst shape today because they've had that false affluence and they just don't produce as much per capita as the Germans do. So there's this efficiency that they're struggling with. When you think about Europe, if you like Europe, like me, what you like about it is the cultural variety. You drive from here to Seattle and it's a whole different language, you know? And in, in Europe there's uh, so much variety. And you'd think as it gets united and one, no borders and everybody's got the same money, you're gonna lose that variety. And counterintuitively, the opposite is the case. Europe is getting more diverse as it unites. Why is that? Because there's three loyalties, region, country, and Europe. Ask somebody in Barcelona, where are you from? He could say Catalonia, he could say Spain, or he could say Europe, depending on their outlook. Ask a friend in Munich, where are you from? He could say, I'm from Bavaria, or I'm from Germany, or I'm from Europe. If you go to any city hall these days in Europe, you'll see three flags. The region, the country, and Europe. And uh, I think it's pretty exciting to think that Europe is, you know, the, the headlines in our lifetime has really been struggles between regions and nations, right? Basques bugging Paris, Brittany people bugging Paris, Catalonian people bugging Madrid, Scottish people and Irish people bugging London. Now, as Paris and London and Madrid realize that Europe is evolving and they're no longer gonna be so important politically, 
the troublesome groups no longer bother anybody because you cannot secede from Europe. Catalonian people want independence from Spain, but they don't want to secede from Europe. That doesn't make any sense at all. So as Brussels becomes the capital of Europe, these little groups find more support and they don't threaten people so much. When you travel around, you'll find physical examples of that. You go to Scotland today in Edinburgh, they got a brand new parliament building, which is the first time the Scottish people have had a parliament in Scotland since 1707. Why? London's not threatened. Doesn't need to be. You go to Barcelona, and after mass on Sunday in front of the cathedral, you'll find people gathered in their big circle dance doing the sardana. They would all have been arrested if they did that a generation ago under Franco. They're teaching their kids Catalan first and Spanish second. They can wave their country flag instead of their football flag, which is what they had to raise, wave before. I asked my friend, okay, I talked to him in Catalan. I said, so you're in the region of Catalonia, right? No, it's not a region. That implies we're part of Spain. We are a nation without a state. <laughs> That's the politically correct thing. They're not a region. They are a nation that didn't get a border. You see, it's, they're quite strong about that. And when you go to a Subway sandwich shop in Madrid these days, you'll find, you're very likely to find, a menu with four languages on it. Because in Spain, there's four languages. You got Catalonian, you got Basque, you got Galatian, and you got Espanol. Here we have an ATM machine in Barcelona. And first button on the language things on the ATM machine is Catalan. Second would be Spanish, Espanol. Then Galego, that's for the people of northwestern Spain. And then Basque, also in Spain. And then you've got German, French, English, and everybody else. <laughs> Now, if you were to go to a, an ATM machine in Basque country, you'd find Uscara first, and you'd always find Catalan on that ATM machine. Not because Catalonians in Basque need to have Catalan to find what money to get. They could speak English or Spanish. But as a matter of solidarity with each other, the little underdog nations stick up for each other. That's why when I was in Northern Ireland, I found an inordinate amount of Basque and Catalonian tourists. Not many people go to Northern Ireland on vacation. Basque and Catalonians do because they can relate to their fellow victims of the tyranny of the, of the majority. It's a fascinating thing to check out. And while I was in Northern, Northern Ireland, I noticed in the flagpoles, the Union Jack, and under the Union Jack was the flag of Israel. Now why would that be? It's because the Protestant settlers put there centuries ago by London to establish a foothold in Catholic Ireland for political purposes could empathize with Irish settlers put in Palestinian country by Jerusalem to establish a Jewish foothold in Palestinian country. It's not a judgment. I mean, you know, they're innocent, these, these Protestants in Scotland, they're innocent today, you know, but their great-great-great-grandfathers kicked out uh, Catholic people. And to this day, you got these pesky Catholics all around you grumbling about being so poor. You see? I mean, that's the interesting thing about settling. Whenever a society settles people in order to establish something that is imperial, 200 years from now, people are going to be paying the price. Russians were put in Estonia 50 years ago to dilute Estonian people and to help that country be more Russian or more Soviet. Today, a third of Estonia is Russian. And it's a big problem in that society. And it's no fun being Russian in Estonia. So these are fun little, at least fun to me, little uh, aspects of culture that you pick up if you want to travel in a politically aware kind of way. This man's name is Armin Walsh. Armin is the Indiana Jones of Tyrolean archaeologists. <laughs> he loves to dig up castles and turn them into museums. And he's from the Tyrol. Now when he wants money, and it's expensive to renovate all these castles, he doesn't go to Vienna, his national capital. He goes to the capital of Europe, Brussels. And he doesn't go up there and say, I got something really cool for Austria because he'll go home empty handed because Brussels is not going to give you anything for Austrian castles because that's a false border, ignoring ethnicities. Brussels is really into ethnic regions. So Armin goes to Brussels and smartly says, I'm doing something for the Tyrol. 
That's an ethnic region that includes uh, Austria and Italy. We all think Tyrolia, Austria, yodeling and all that stuff, but the town of Tyrol for which it's named is actually in Italy, you see. And he gets his money from Brussels and he renovates this in the name of Tyrolean culture. I mentioned uh, the, the poor states, Ireland, Greece, Portugal. When I first started traveling, I distinctly remember no freeways in any of these countries. Autobahns everywhere in Germany, no freeways in those countries. Today, all those countries are laced by beautiful freeways. This happens to be in Ireland. And with every new freeway, you see a European flag. And in this case, it says, this project has received 85% funding from the European Union. That means this is paid for by Germany and France. Now, get busy and work hard because we're gonna keep up with the United States. <laughs> It's just like when we did, when Eisenhower did our interstate system, you know, back in the 50s, that was a lot of money to make a nice freeway from Seattle to Spokane and from here to Helen Arrow. I don't know how it works beyond here, but uh, you know, that, it's just, uh, I, I don't think that anybody figured people in Montana don't get good roads, you know? It was all for one and one for all with the infrastructure. And that's what they're thinking in Europe today Consequently, Eastern Germany has as good a road system as Western Germany now. And it's quite exhilarating to see how Europe has invested in itself in our generation uh, to do that. Now here's a, this is a bridge in Greece over the, Corinth, uh, the Gulf of Corinth. I, for all my life, have been going to this spot and taking a funky little ferry across. And suddenly I come back one year and there's this huge bridge. What's the deal? This is not a Greek bridge. This is a German bridge, clearly a German bridge built in Greece to get big German trucks into the Peloponnesian Peninsula with their gummy bears. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Germany pays for that bridge because they want to get at that market. And that's kind of how it works. And you see that all over the place. They're investing in their train system like we just cannot imagine. In fact, faster and faster trains. It's a dangerous place if you're a slow bird. I was recently in the train station in Munich, just for fun, I was taking pictures of birds squished onto the windshields of trains as they rolled into the station. <laughs> and I looked at that and I thought, that's almost surreal. You'd wait all your life to see a bird squished onto the windshield of a train where I live. Yeah. <laughs> You'd wait all your life to see a train where I live. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, those trains are fast in Europe. I mean, it's really... For me, one of the great delights of traveling around Europe is just getting on those super trains and, and going. I just love it. Uh, now, you're going to see a lot of this in your travels. And, you know, I'm in the business of taking people to Europe. I, I took 12,000 people to Europe this year on 400 different tours. It's how I make my money. And uh, we're very enthusiastic about uh, encouraging people to take our tours and so on. And um, we have to deal with this sort of thing. A lot of people say, I don't want to go there. They hate us. Well, they don't hate us. A lot of people over there just don't like our militarism and they don't like our trade policy. You know, but they like us. I've never found I had to disguise who I am. And I've met a lot, most people over there don't get our trade policies. Most people in the world don't want to militarize space. Only America wants to militarize space. They just had a vote in the United Nations a few months ago. The vote was 170 to one. Shall we militarize space or not? Raise your hand if you want to. United States. Raise your hand if you don't want to. Everybody else. 171. It is routine when there's a vote in the United Nations, even in the age of Obama, when there's issues that matter to the desperately poor half of humanity. It's 150 to 4. Child labor laws, landmines, water rights, debt forgiveness. 150 to 4. Who stands with the United States of America? Israel. Marshall Islands, and Micronesia. The coalition of the bribed. I mean, the coalition of the brave. Right? Now, again, I, it doesn't matter what I think, but we just have to realize it does matter what everybody else thinks because we've got to live in this world. So I'm just bringing home the news that 96% of humanity looks at us like we're an empire. And there's never been an empire in history that didn't have angry people on the fringes shooting in from the bushes. That's just what happens when you're an empire. You, you don't line up in formation. The Redcoats did that against us and it didn't work very well. Or we did that, we, did, we learned, we got to shoot him from the bushes when we were fighting a big empire. And uh, I mean, Romans had barbarians, Habsburgs had anarchists, we got terrorists. 
So it's just, it just goes with the territory. The United, Nation, the United States spends as much as everybody else in the world put together on our military. A lot of Americans don't realize that. We're at a crossroads in our society now. We're closing down parks. We're talking about four days a week of school instead of five days, cutting out all sorts of regulations so we can poison our kids to make more money for our corporations. We're doing all sorts of goofy stuff because we're in crisis economically. But we're spending twice today on the military that we were 10 years ago. And we don't really have the enemies we used to have. But I mean, the rest of the world looks at this and they see a country that's drunk on militarism. We've got military bases in 150 countries. Only we can declare somebody else's resources on the other side of the planet vital to our, quote, national security interest. Well, they look at it and they think, can't you just be honest and say vital to our custom material lifestyle? <laughs> you know, because that's what it is. That's exactly what it is, if we're honest. The honesty hurts. So once again, it's just important when we travel to realize that's why we see this kind of sign. When I'm in Denmark, my friends tell me, be careful with the marijuana. We have to arrest a couple of pot smokers every year in order to maintain favored trade status with the United States of America. <laughs> I was just at a drug policy convention in Los Angeles last month. Learned a lot about this from a lot of people all over the world who are trying to deal with drug problems in a pragmatic harm reduction way. The United Nations single-handedly extorts the entire world to keep marijuana illegal because who knows why? I mean, there's lots of reasons. But there's 50,000 people dead in Mexico because marijuana, to a great extent, because marijuana is illegal. There's a lot of people that want to make a difference in the law, but the United States, this, I'm just talking about this because it's something I know about, but in many, many, many cases, it's that heavy hand of America on this planet. Now, of course, we saved the world from communism. We saved the world from Hitler. We've got incredible energy and ingenuity, and we've set the tone for freedom and all that kind of stuff. But there is an ugly reality that it, it's an option if we want to grapple with it. But when you travel, you're going to see that. And I just want to tell you, it's not anti-you or anti-me. It's simply anti-American trade policy and anti-American militarism. Okay? You can go anywhere and be received politely because people like Americans. You do not need to accessorize with <laughs> Canadian flags. There are more Americans wearing Canadian flags in Europe than there are Canadians wearing American <laughs> Canadian flags. I take a lot of people to France. I take thousands of people to France every year in our tours. And uh, you know, uh, my challenge when I was doing the tour guiding was to prepare people in Switzerland so they'd come into France and be received well. And I know from my experience, if you, French are proud people. You know, French are very proud. Their, their language was the lingua franca. I mean, look at your passport. There's two languages on it. French and English. Uh, there was a time when the Tsar in Russia spoke better French than English and was proud of it. You know, and France has, France has lost two world wars and today they're a second rate power compared to the days when they were really on top. And they don't, they're not, I don't think losing gracefully is one of their fortes. Um, <laughs> so a, a lot of Americans think the French just, you know, are mean spirited or don't like it or something. Well, they're not a smiley face culture. They're more into genuineness. They belittle us for our smiley faces and bank tellers that are fined if they don't wish everybody to have a happy day and this kind of thing. Shopping cart baskets that say smile and be a winner. Um, you know, that just bugs French people. Uh, when you, but when you go to France, if you just, you don't need to embrace their values, but if you can just respect their values and be curious about them and not try to tell them how to do things, they're really wonderful people to visit with. I, we have a great time visiting France as anywhere. I was recently filming in a little mom and pop chateau in Burgundy, the most traditionally French part of France, I think. And uh, I, when I'm filming, get out of the way, I mean, the sun's going down, I need to get up on the rooftop to get a nice wide shot of the turrets. And the, the mom and pop uh, aristocratic couple that had owned this, uh, from the family that had owned this castle for generations and generations says, we have an American film crew, we must have a little party. I didn't want a party, I don't want to film. No, we gotta have a party, all right. So I bring out the nice wine and the cheese and the bread and, uh, and then, all of a sudden, they surprised me with this incredible 48-star American flag. They brought it out like it was a religious relic. And they said, we hoisted this over our village on that great day in 1944 when our village was liberated from Nazi tyranny by America. And we want you to go home and tell your friends and neighbors that we will forever be thankful for the valor and the heroism and the compassion of America in the darkest times in Europe, you know. So, Please don't let people tell you they don't remember that. I could give a whole talk about anecdotal examples of how my friends in Europe are forever thankful for that. 
But 70 years later, it doesn't mean they need to follow us into all of our wars in lockstep. If you think that's the quid pro quo, that's where we part ways with Europe, you see. They're proud people, they've suffered in wars, and they believe all other options should be exhausted first, naive as they might be. I noticed when I was in Europe recently, the, when the Gulf War was going on, the one country that really supported the Gulf War, the preemptive attack, was Poland. Because leading up to World War II, Poland called for a preemptive attack of the Saddam Hussein of that generation, Hitler, and nobody listened to them. And then Hitler went crazy and Poland really suffered. So Poland was more likely to re recognize if there's a tyrant, you do whatever you can to get rid of him early. So that was an interesting sort of historical reason the Poles would be more into that. But when we travel, we have to deal with this sort of reality. When I travel, well, when we travel, we do have the specter of terrorism. And I've been at this for 30 years now, and there's always been terrorism. There always will be terrorism, and Americans are always going to be targeted. It's just, it's kind of silly to target, you know, the Dutch. Um, <laughs> If you're a terrorist, you target the big guy. <laughs> and uh, I don't want to belittle it, and I don't want to um, make light of it, but I do want to belittle and make light of otherwise well-educated and sophisticated Americans' ability to get a grip when it comes to understanding the risk. It's a minuscule risk, you know? I mean, I'm not talking about some major attack on our homeland. That's a serious issue that I'd be as conservative as anybody on. I'm talking about, are you safe to go to Turkey? or Israel, or Morocco, or Estonia, Portugal, Ireland. You know, some people would say no, because there's terrorism, I'd say yes, you're safe. Tomorrow, if an American is beheaded by a jihadist in Madrid, is it safe for you to go to Spain? The answer is yes. 12 million Americans go to Europe every year, none are hurt. 12 million come back. Year after year, when was the last time an American was hurt by a terrorist in Europe? Just, you know. Every year in our society, 13,000 people are killed by handguns. That's real. Every year, more than 1,000 people a month killed by handguns. In Europe, they choose not to have handguns and they lose, you know, one-eighth of the people to violence that we do on the streets. Europeans laugh out loud when they hear that Americans are staying home for safety reasons. <laughs> if you care about your loved ones, you will take them to Europe tomorrow. <laughs> This is how I sell tours. <laughs> so, I mean, I just really believe that if you overreact to terrorism, you're playing into their hands. I mean, think of what a magnificent success 9-11 was from a terrorist point of view. We changed our whole country. We bankrupted our whole country. We're, we've, we've gone against our values. We lost 2,800 people. Yeah, it's tough, but we're not the first country to lose a couple thousand people, you know. It happens all the time. Honduras lost that many people in a mudslide, and it was hardly headlines. And they only have five million, or three million, or something like that. So it's just important to be out there and realize what the other 96% of humanity are thinking when they look at us. You don't have to agree with them. They could be wrong, but it's healthy and I think smart to do that. And if you hate terrorism as much as I do, I think you've got to realize the most effective thing we can do as Americans is to travel a lot. Learn about the world and come home and help our country fit better into this ever smaller planet. It's a beautiful place, and it's valuable for us to go over there and humanize our country because we're so likable when people meet us one-on-one. -on -one. All over Europe, there are Fourth of Julys. Every country's got their own. In Switzerland, it's August 1st. In Norway, it's May 17th. France, it's July 14th. It's so exciting to be in countries and experience their joy on their terms. I was raised thinking the world is a pyramid with us on top and everybody else trying to get there. Until well into my adulthood, I believed that if a country didn't see it our way, because we care, we should go in there and find them a government that saw it the right way, you know? And then I realized people don't all have the American dream. People have different dreams. That's not a bad thing, that's a beautiful thing. These people have the Sri Lankan dream. Norwegians have the Norwegian dream, Moroccans have the Moroccan dream. And when you travel, you realize there's a lot of pride on this planet. A lot of Americans underestimate the pride out there. They got spine. They'll, they'll fight to the end, you know? They got pride that, that, and spine that we might even not understand. I was in a cafeteria in, Istan, in uh, Afghanistan once, uh, in Kabul, and I was just minding my own business, and a man sat next to me, and, I, and he said, can I join you? 
And I said, you already have. And uh, he said, uh, you're an American? I said, yeah. He said, I'm a professor here in Afghanistan, and I want you to know that a third of the people on this planet eat with spoons and forks like you do. A third of the people eat with chopsticks, and a third of the people eat with their fingers like I do, and we're all civilized just the same. That's what he said, we're all civilized just the same. And I thought, boy, you've got a chip on your shoulder. Um, <laughs> But I, I thought about it later than that, and he really, he understood that those of us who use spoons and forks really thought that people with their fingers were a little less civilized, you know? And, and he wanted to make that point. And for the rest of my trip through South Asia, I was going to fine restaurants filled with local people who were professional, well-dressed people, Cer no silverware in the place at all, ceremonial sink in the middle of the room. People would wash their hands and use their fingers for what God intended them to be used for, to nourish them. And it became quite natural. In fact, when I got home, I had to be retrained to use spoons and books. <laughs> but I just thought that was just a fun little lesson you can have when you're traveling. There are proud struggles going on. Every year on this planet, eight or 10 languages, distinct languages die out. With no fanfare, it's just eight or 10 ethnic groups lose their battle. It's a slow battle. By the time they lose, everybody's even forgotten they exist. That last person who speaks that language dies. One little bit less ethnic diversity on this planet. Now, all of these ethnic groups have their own Nathan Hales, Patrick Henrys, and Ethan Allens. I was raised thinking, Patrick Henry, Nathan Hale, the ultimate. And then I realized there are a dime a dozen on this planet. Not to be little ours, but the other countries have their own. They don't even know ours, they know theirs. They're surprised we don't know theirs. It's pretty exciting. And in your travels, to make your travels a little more real, you can, you can try to empathize with present day Nathan Hales. A very easy example would be Archbishop Oscar Romero in El Salvador. I had the good fortune of going down to Salvador four or five times since they had their civil war, checking it out and just learning from it and so on. And uh, of course they had a horrible civil war and it was this, you know, communists against capitalists kind of thing where you got the landless peasants wanting more rights and you got big landowners saying, you know, just shut up and work on the plantation and we'll sell you canned goods from the United States. And um, it was a very bloody thing, very difficult thing, a lot of propaganda, hard to know what, was, what end was up. I went down there and got to talk to all sorts of different parties, and it was quite a powerful experience. I gained a really big respect for Archbishop Oscar Romero. He was a champion of the downtrodden, of the poor, you know, of the landless peasants. He said, I'll be likely killed, but I will rise again in my people. And of course, he was shot, and he rose in his people like you cannot imagine, just like he predicted, and you see these beautiful, banners of him, right, of the people radiating with that Romero passion for justice. A couple of years ago, I was heading for Mazatlan for a nice vacation. I was due for a vacation. I was ready for a pristine stretch of tropical beach, swept free of local riffraff. It's just going to be me, a masseuse, and a plastic band on my wrist that gave me unlimited margaritas. You know what I mean? Oh, baby, that's a good vacation. And then somebody invited me to El Salvador for the 25th anniversary of the assassination of this guy. And I told my friends and family, I'm not going to have any fun on the beach. I got to go to El Salvador. And uh, I was there. And I was in a sweaty dorm bunk covered with bug bites, eating rice and beans one day and beans and rice the next, <laughs> having the time of my life. I was so glad I was there. I was marching in the streets with tens of thousands of Salvadorans. We stopped by this monument in the capital city of El Salvador. And I thought, this looks a lot like a monument we all know and love. It's a perfect knockoff of our Vietnam Memorial with just as many names chipped into the black granite. And then it occurred to me, whoa, each one of those names is a person who died fighting me. We killed them. Maybe they were communists and they had to be killed, but the United States killed them, pretty clearly. Now, again, I'm, I'm not, I, either way, I'm, I'm, uh, it doesn't matter what's right or wrong here. The, the reality is you got 50,000 families that have lost a loved one and they blame America. That's the reality. Think of the cultural baggage we have in our country. When we grew up, it was the Depression, clean your plate. Then it was the Nazis, or World War II, and Pearl Harbor, and then it was the Cold War, and now it's 9-11. Think of 9-11, it's, how it's changed our life in the last 10 years. Okay, that's our baggage. Other countries have similar baggage. In El Salvador, it's 50,000 people's names on this wall. I went to Iran, and I was so excited to go to Iran, 
And uh, I made a TV show for public television. And I just really wanted to humanize 70, 70 million Iranians when I figured we were going to war. People ask me, why are you going to Iran? And I thought about it, because it's a strange thing to want to do. And I thought, you know, I'm going there because it's just good style to know people before you bomb them. <laughs> you know, societies are inclined to dehumanize their enemies, aren't they? So when you kill them, nobody even cares. Do you remember the, a, long, a while ago there was a wedding party in the desert outside of Pakistan or something and there was a tall guy and we thought he might have been Osama bin Laden. So the drone just killed everybody in the wedding party. The bride, the groom, grandma and grandpa, all the kids, all the friends, and the tall guy. And then later on they find out it wasn't Osama bin Laden. Well, that that's too bad, he shouldn't be so tall. Uh, you know, we didn't even give it a second thought. And then you remember the cute blonde girl who was uh, kidnapped in Aruba? What's her name? See, everybody knows her name. She's a household word. I'm not against her. I'm just wondering, why does our compassion stop there with somebody who looks like us and who's as rich as us? She's not more precious than the unnamed girl that got killed in the desert because she went to that wedding and the guy was tall. She's not more precious. And I refuse to let anybody tell me that the girl in Aruba is more precious than that. That's just part of honesty with this planet, I think. Now, I went to Iran, and I was afraid to go to Iran. I almost left our big camera in Athens because I thought they'd be throwing stones at us when they saw an American crew on the streets of Tehran. Thank goodness I, for some reason, had the nerve to bring our big, expensive, fancy camera because we've never been received so warmly on the streets of anywhere that we filmed us when we were in Iran doing our work. It was an amazing experience, and anybody here could have that experience if they wanted to. Anybody could go to Iran and learn about that society. It was completely new for me. It's very difficult. I mean, you're in a booming city of 12 million people with 10-story tall posters that say, down with the USA. That is painful to see. It makes you angry. You wonder, what's going on here? A flag made out of dropping bombs and skulls. OK, now how old is that? Who put it up there? Why is it there? It's a complicated issue. Do they really think that, death to America? I was in a traffic jam down here under that flag and it was just silent we we're just sitting in the car suddenly my driver just bursts out he says death to traffic <laughs> death to traffic <laughs> I thought it was death to America what about that big sign he said well right now it's death to traffic <laughs> and I asked him well why do you say that and he said well in Iran when something's frustrating to us and it's out of our control we say death to that and I thought about it, and I thought about all my friends here in America that freak out every time Ahmadinejad says death to America. You know, that's the whole rallying cry. They say death to America, we'll kill them. And I wondered, why do they say that? Well, first of all, he speaks Farsi, and he translates pretty crudely. And he's saying, damn America. That's what he's saying, quite obviously. Then I thought, have I ever thought, damn somebody? And I thought, well, to be honest, yeah, I have thought, damn those teenagers on occasion. <laughs> Now, do I really want them to die and burn in hell for an eternity? <laughs> no, it's just after midnight. Turn down the music. Damn those teenagers, you know? <laughs> Death to traffic. Death to election fraud. Death to the Shah. Death to America. Death to Khomeini. They've all, that's what they say. That's how they talk. And we Americans are, we insult ourselves by making a bumper stick out of it and freak out about it. We let ourselves do that. We know we're being stupid and naive and simple-minded, but we let ourselves do it because it makes it easier for us to, to do the things we do, I guess. When you travel, you have to deal with the complexity of the world in a beautiful way. And Iran's a great place to travel. It's a complicated place. It's a place with terrible baggage. We were talking about 9-11 baggage. They lost a couple hundred thousand people fighting a guy named Saddam Hussein who was funded by the United States when he invaded their country. They had carnage on their border with Iraq that was like Germany and France in World War I. Now, maybe we don't believe that we really paid Saddam to invade. Doesn't really matter. They believe it, and they've got 200,000 widows. I mean, that's the baggage. That's who's putting Ahmadinejad in power, is people like this woman, who every week for 20 years has sat on the tomb of her son or her husband or her dad and cried and probably cursed America. It's a powerful scene to go to a cemetery. And in every town in Iran, there's a vast martyr's cemetery. It's called a martyr's cemetery. 
filled with people who they think were killed by America via Saddam Hussein. So that's complicated, and they don't just get over that that easy. You know, she's probably not a very sophisticated political mind, and she's had to live with all sorts of very clever propaganda to demonize you and me. What's the solution? I think the solution is to try to better understand them, to realize where are they coming from. They grew up with the Shah on the throne. When the Shah was on the throne for a whole generation, he was put there by throwing out a democratically elected prime minister, and he was thrown out in 53 because he nationalized their oil, and he can't do that. There's no question about why we put the Shah on the throne. And when the Shah was on the throne for 30 years or whatever, they were bragging that the miniskirts are shorter in Tehran than they are in Paris. Now, I think that's cool. <laughs> but if you are a salt-of-the-earth Iranian mother, you're disgusted by this demon on the throne who America put there so they could get our oil. You know, they're not dumb. They can put all those, they can connect the dots there. I was on the street in Iran and this, just doing my work, a woman came across the street. She said, are, are you an American journalist? I said, yeah. She did this on my chest, you know, and she said, I want you to go home and tell the truth. We're strong, we're united, and we just don't want our little girls to be raised like Britney Spears. <laughs> First thing I thought is, we've got something in common here, you know? <laughs> she was worried that if we changed their government, regime change, put in somebody that we can work with, you know, we can do that without giving it a second thought. American values will come in, and her little girl will become a boy toy, a drug addict, and a crass materialist. Of course, she's a victim of propaganda, but it's not an unreasonable fear if you lived there and saw what was coming in from the West. You can't imagine Iran's attitude to the West because of their 2,000 years of history with the West. I was there in their museum trying to film, and I got to the National Museum, which had all the treasures, I thought, for Persepolis and Xerxes and Cyrus and all that incredible stuff. And it's nothing but a few broken vases. And I was traumatized. I got a TV show to make. Where's your good stuff? I talked to the curator. This is, you call this a museum? He said, if you want to see our treasures, you've got to go to Europe, because all of our treasures are in Europe. Now, an American might say, get over it, but you can't get over that. You know, your Liberty Bell is in Moscow. What are you going to do? <laughs> Go to Moscow and, and, and do your Yankee Doodle. You know, it just doesn't work. So it's a complicated thing, and it's fun to get in there and, 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 and learn about it. And it occurred to me, why would a guy that seems so nutty as Ahmadinejad be in power? And because he's so bombastic, there's a good chance we're going to have a war with him. How can he be voted into power? Who supports him? Well, he's supported by a vast country, 70 million people, and a majority of them are not big city sophisticates. They're small town, less educated, fundamentalists, motivated by exactly the same things their counterparts are here in the United States. They're good people motivated by fear and love. Good people motivated by fear and love. And they don't understand us and they're victimized by propaganda. We can go there and we can learn about it. Or we can be less easy to manipulate here. And if they say Iran assassinated the uh, ambassador by hiring some thug in Mexico to do it, you can kind of go, well, wait a minute, is it that simple? Remember what happened a couple months ago? We just embraced that. Oh, yeah, let's go to get them, you know. But it's always more complicated. Or it's, it, it may be more complicated, and we owe it ourselves to get to know these people. It was so fun to go there. I, I would highly recommend it. Anybody can go there. We have an economic embargo on them, so you can't. You're not supposed to spend money there and stuff, but you can take a tour and you can, uh, you can go there on vacation. Easy, perfectly legal. In fact, the Lonely Planet guidebook to Iran sells quite well, not among Americans, but everybody else who goes there. <laughs> well, a lot of people are excited about their liberties, and I want to spend some time just talking about the fun in Europe and how their different liberties are going so on. But I do know that we have a raffle and we have some books to sell and we need to take just a short stretch. So what I want to do is, I think I got 20 more minutes or something to talk, but I know that uh, the scholarship program is going to raise some money with the raffle. So if you want to buy any more raffle items, then they're going to raffle off uh, all these goodies over there. And then the local bookstore has the Travel as a Political Act book over there. I think it sells for about $20 including tax. And here it's uh, even 15 
including tax. Okay, so that's a very good discount. Uh, if you wanna grab those, that would be great. Also, as I mentioned, in the back, there's a Smithsonian Magazine. Uh, I got to collaborate with the people at Smithsonian. It was so much fun, and they wanted me to write my favorite top 20 places up. I just assumed I would uh, use my photos, and they said, Rick, we'll take care of the art. <laughs> And at first I was kind of, well, what? And then I, I realized, what a, what a thrill to have my favorite articles uh, put together with wonderful Smithsonian photographs. So I, this sold out all over the country. I liked it so much, I bought, I bought 50,000 extra copies and I just give them away wherever I go. So please, one per family, but if you'd like one, I'd love for you to have that. And it highlights my favorite 20 places. And um, also, um, the biggest part of our business, I, I work with 80 people in Edmonds, just north of Seattle, and uh, the hottest thing in our business uh, is our tour program. Uh, as I mentioned, we had our best year ever this year. We took 11,000 people on 400 different tours, 30 different itineraries. They're all explained in here. If you're curious about our tour program, my uh, sales director just told me this year's sales are actually a lot ahead, a thousand seats ahead of last year's sales at this time, so um, there's a lot of people traveling, I'll tell you that. And she told me 52% of the people who have signed up so far for next year's tours are return customers, people who have been with us before. Point is, if it's, if it's, if it's, the, it's a quirky kind of tour, but if it's right for you, it's, it's really a great opportunity. Small groups, wonderful guides, our passion for Europe, lots of different itineraries. So that's back there. There's a DVD in here that gives you a good candid look at what our tour program's like. Uh, so go ahead, and if you're under the raffle, get a book or pick up those freebies, that's cool. And we'll carry on in just about six or seven minutes, okay? Last year you said uh, India was your favorite country to travel to. Could you say why? India is my favorite country to travel. Well, it really uh, humbles your ethnocentricity in a beautiful way. I, I really like to get out of my comfort zone, and you know, all of us are kind of self-assured. I know what good music is. And then you go to India, and you find people don't even recognize meter and, uh, and uh, uh, what do you call it, mode. You know, it's a whole different uh, system of music. And at a glance, or whatever a, an audio glance is, it uh, it's just doesn't sound very good. But when you realize, it's just as beautiful and sophisticated as ours. So that really humbled me. India has different approach to time, to pain, to love, to music, to all sorts of stuff. And uh, I just love being, I love it when people rearrange my cultural furniture and then I get to s figure out the lay of the land again. So in, in, in Europe, Italy, I think, is the closest thing to Italy and that's my favorite country in Europe is Italy. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to go back to India, but I'm just focusing on Europe in my work. Yeah? You do all this traveling around the world. How many languages do you know more than just a few? Like, hello, goodbye, thank you. Uh, how many languages do I, do I know? I only know uh, English. That's why Ireland was so nice, because I mentioned, because I had the sensation of understanding a foreign language. Uh, it's nothing to brag about, but it does substantiate my teaching when I say that, you know, you don't need to be a linguist to travel. I've been able to make my TV shows, write my guidebooks, lead my tours, and have vacations all over Europe, regardless of where, you, where they speak English. And counterintuitively, the biggest language barrier you'll find is in the countries that have the most people speaking it, like Spain and... Um, Italy would have a bigger language barrier than Estonia or Hungary. Because if you're Estonian, there's only a million people on this planet that can talk to you, unless you speak another language. And if you're going to speak another language, if you're young and with it today, you're going to choose English. That's the language that gets you some distance. Uh, but if you're Italian or Spanish and you speak Italian or Spanish and that's it, you've got a reasonable world to function in. That's my theory anyways. But I speak only English. Yes. Thank you for remembering Spokane as part of your world. I appreciate you coming. Uh, I really want to wish this upon you, but have you ever thought of running for president? No. Uh, um, all I want to do politically is legalize marijuana in this state, okay? So, and uh, you'll hear about that. In fact, I'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, I, I would be so frustrated in Washington, D.C. right now. And I've got great respect for anybody who can put up with all of that and still not be disheartened. And uh, I don't sit in meetings very well. I've got friends who are Congress people and so on, and they're just so good. I think they're so, they're, they know the, how, to, how, to, how it works, and I just don't. And I, I really feel like I, I am having so much fun doing this, and, and we can, I can have an impact. We just, um, John just mentioned our little fundraiser for Bread for the World. Bread for the World, if you don't know what it is, it's, a, it's the only lobby organization I know that speaks up for hungry and homeless people in the halls of Congress. I mean, it's quite amazing if you're a congressman and all you got is these people with their own interests coming in and hammering away at you, and you got to relent, you got to listen to them. And nobody's speaking up for homeless people, really. And uh, Bread for the World does, and they do it very effectively. And right now, we're trying to balance the 
the budget, I believe, to a certain degree on the backs of desperately poor people. And I want a fiscal responsibility and all that, but we don't need to make desperate people even more desperate. There's enough money in this country to have a certain threshold of decency when it comes to people who are frankly losers in, cap in the whole capitalism game, you know. Doesn't mean you gotta be wretched like Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities or something like that. So, uh, but just with our little initiative, just in the last two days we've raised $50,000 to empower, basically to hire a couple of lobbyists to help teach Congress the, uh, the fallout of their decisions on hung hungry people. So I can do a lot just through the fun of my own business and I'm happy to do that. Um, and this book is a fun way to talk. I get to talk to a bunch of neat people like you about these ideas that are really important to me. I mean, this is a real thrill to be able to come here and share all this. Uh, yeah? In the Smithsonian book, there's a page about a small ship cruising. Have you done any small ship cruising uh, in the European rivers? I've, I've never done any small ship cruising, and I would like to someday. I, I grew up in the San Juans, basically. I love boats. I, I have gotten into cruising, though, in the last year. We've got one of my best-selling guidebooks is called The Rick Steves Guide to Mediterranean Cruise Ports. And it's a very fast-growing segment of the basic mainstream tourism industry in Europe. You got these huge cruise ships with three, four thousand people on them all over the place. And uh, I just decided I want to I want to take some of the information I've already written because all that information exists, retool it for the needs of cruisers, and cobble it together in a book that takes you from Barcelona to Istanbul. I just spent 20 days doing two cruises that whole stretch, and I was ready to have a cynical attitude about it, but it was really good, you know? And on that cruise ship, there's, I was on two different cruise ships. I figured there's, the, both of them were sold out. There's about 3,000 tourists on each of them. To me, my own little uh, assessment would be 1,000 of those 3,000 were just enjoying a floating Las Vegas. That was fine, and they're happy. And occasionally they go ashore and have a pizza. And uh, uh, one third were pretty lazy tourists. They just wanted to see some famous things. And then one third were real travelers that just wanted to move into one hotel and see, have one exciting day in each country for seven days in a row. Nothing wrong with that. But I wanted to make a guidebook for those people, the travelers that hit the ground running as soon as that gang planks down. And I just had a great time. And uh, by the way, I've got a Facebook page, which uh, I just love working on. It got, just was called the, the uh, blog of the year by the Society of American Travel Writers. And it's just, I get to take uh, people with me when I'm making the TV shows, going on a cruise, I took my, I sign up for my tours, every year I sign up for one of my tours if I can. And uh, I signed up for my Turkey tour this year. It's really fun, I get letters from me when I sign up for one of my own tours. Um, <laughs> and I had a great two weeks in Turkey, uh, learning from one of our guides, and I got to report on it for two weeks in a row on the Facebook page. So if you're curious about that, the whole cruise thing, I have like 18 days in a row about uh, my take on cruising on the Facebook. Yeah? I don't do Facebook, but there was a story about uh, how much weight you were gonna gain on the yeah. What was that? What was that? Oh, I just had a Facebook contest where, because I was pigging out for, um, you know, eight, 16 or 18 days in a row, but I was exercising a lot, and I lost one pound over the experience. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't want to gain any weight, so, uh, but we had an ethic of using the stairs instead of the elevators on the ship, which lasted for the first half of the whole, whole experience. <laughs> yeah. Visiting, finding family in other countries? Do I have advice for finding family in other countries? I found if you are from a certain country and you don't know who your relatives are, you can just get a phone book out and make up a name. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but people love to meet you, you know? I mean, I had distant relatives that they didn't know who I was and I came into town and I, I, I looked them up and they were so excited to have somebody drop in on them. I've, you can find out who your distant relatives are, send them an email somehow, let them know you're coming, and you can tell by their response whether they want you to come by or not. If they just say have a good time or, or you know, whatever, you, you can take a hint. But chances are they're going to beg you to come by. And I've been visiting my relatives around Norway forever, and it's really, if you've got relatives anywhere in your travels, it's a real bonus to look them up for sure. Yeah. You say that I, I, I caught the notion that uh, English was the considered to be the universal language in Europe. Why would that be? Why is English the universal language in Europe? Well, it's the popular language of popular culture. Our culture is really, I mean, English pop culture. It's the language of the internet. Uh, it's the language of international business. 
It's the language of India, that's a billion people. I mean, people in India all communicate from a business point of view, I believe in English. Um, and uh, if you're gonna choose one language, Europeans want to learn a second language so they have a bigger world. And in the old days, you know, you'd learn German or French or Russian, but now in one generation it's changed, so the dominant choice for second language would be English. It's not the right choice, some people still learn Portuguese and they go to Brazil a lot, you know, and it's fine. But English really makes the most sense. If you go to the, um, tr the airport in Amsterdam, you'll find there's, they've even dispensed with Dutch. They just say everybody speaks English. They'll just do signs in English. See, so we, if you're hiking in the Alps and you meet and a, and a, and a, germ, and a Greek meets a Norwegian, they will communicate in broken English. Think about it, what Greek speaks Norwegian? <laughs> Greeks do connect with Norwegians, but they, they do it with a common language, which invariably would be English. One more question, anybody? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm aware there's a growing anti-Muslim sentiment in uh, Western Europe, especially because of the influx of uh, Muslims. Uh, have you experienced that in your recent um, trips over to Europe? And do you think this is a growing problem that will manifest itself in some way in the future? Henry Kissinger th thinks you should go to Europe now because in a generation it's all going to be Muslim. Um, I, I, I read that. and. Uh, I think he's way off base. Um, you know, there's a Muslim minority in Europe is, is like the Hispanic minority or the Mexican minority in the United States or the Hispanic minority. Uh, it's just rich countries import people from south of the border to do their dirty work. It's just a reality. And uh, they bring their kids so they can get citizenship and they have a culture that might have more uh, faster birth rate than the other uh, 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 groups and over time it becomes a bigger and bigger part of the society and you bring them in for cheap labor but it's not just that cheap you have to provide for that you know section of your society and if you don't provide for it well you're going to have uh, indirect costs for that cheap labor we can see it here in our society and it's a complicated issue and in Europe the equivalent of uh, you know, Spanish-speaking uh, uh, domestic labor and is, is Muslims from Northern Africa that come into Europe. Um, do I think it's going to be a big problem? I don't know. I, I, think, uh, I think Europeans want to have everybody assimilate. My take on it is there's two kind of immigrants. There are immigrants that come and want to assimilate and become Danes or Dutch or German and there are immigrants that come and just want to squat in your sparsely populated, relatively affluent corner of the world and maintain their Algerian culture. Now, personally, I don't like the fact that there are families in the Netherlands that have been there for three generations and they speak no Dutch. And, and they have their own little enclave of Algeria and they communicate with Algeria by satellite dishes and Skype and all that kind of stuff, which makes this kind of diaspora much easier these days. And uh, that's a problem. On the other hand, you meet a, a cabbie in Berlin who's Turkish and he's as German as the next guy. It's amazing how assimilated some of them are. And you go to Denmark, I went to the city museum in Denmark and a Pakistani woman who speaks Danish beautifully and knows the Danish culture and history like a, like a person who's been there for many generations took me out to the museum and it was a beautiful experience because here is an immigrant who assimilated. You see, I mean, this is a political issue, and I'm glad I'm not a politician because you're probably damned if you do it, you're damned if you don't when you talk about this thing. But my, three of my grandparents came over from Norway speaking only Norwegian. Two generations later, all I can say is tuck for Martin, you know. Uh, it's just, I, I don't know any Norwegian. Now that's a fast assimilation, isn't it? I'm still proud of my Norwegian heritage. We celebrate Christmas Norwegian style, and I'm a Lutheran, all right? I mean, that's what, that's what Norwegians do. Uh, but. Uh, <laughs> But I've assimilated enthusiastically, and that's the kind of immigrant situation that I think works best. It's an interesting issue in Europe. It's a serious issue. And, um, you know, we tr I, I don't really feel like I'm an authority. I don't, I've talked to a lot of people in my books, for my books, and um, it's an interesting to pay attention to. But I don't think the sky is falling if you happen to be a, a white supremacist in Europe and you don't want your, your everybody to be wearing scarves and, and hearing the call to prayer, you know. But they deal with it. In Spain, they just built a mosque in Granada, which is the most Muslim city in Spain. They just built a new mosque. The Muslim community wanted to have an amplified call to prayer. Allah, five times a day. And the community said, no, you can have a call to prayer, but it's got to be just one voice, not amplified. The Muslims dealt with it. It's cool. 
You see, they have to, they have to, they have to share that town. And uh, it seems very, uh, very good, the range, arrangement they've got. Okay, uh, I want to talk just about the fun of culture in your travels. When you go to Italy, you find a festival in a little town here where the older kids are teaching the younger kids how to make a good ravioli. I, I see ways built into cultures, how they, they go from generation to generation, the beautiful parts of the culture. In France, this small town in the middle of nowhere has enough money from the city hall to, or the chamber of commerce to, to uh, fund an exhibit where you have orbs that let visitors appreciate the fine differences between the, the wines that they make there. And, and you get to you develop a fine nose. And that's a life skill worth having in that part of the uh, world. Europeans like to spend too much money for their loaf of bread in order to buy it from the person who baked it. You see, that's just an ethic of theirs. We might think, oh, that's so inefficient. Let's just go to Costco and we'll have a big freezer in our garage and we only need to go twice a month. And it's cheaper. You know, well, that may turn us on, but that's a horrible thought to Europe because they have a different kind of what we would call family values. You know, the fabric of their community it involves going out and talking to people and, 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 and uh, patronizing small businesses and so on. Europeans really appreciate their fine wine. There's no question about that. And they also know where to fill it up really cheap. <laughs> I just love these gas filling stations in Italy. It's the cheapest liquid money can buy is wine when you're in Italy. I'm very interested how in the United States we're so intent on legislating morality. I've always found this really interesting. A good example is uh, prostitution. I've never met anybody who would say prostitution is a good thing, but prostitution just is. I don't care what kind of laws you have, I don't care what your religion is, there's always going to be lonely men who will pay for sex. And there will be women who will sell it. It's just the way it is. Now, you can make it illegal and you can just say no, or you can have a European approach to it which would be pragmatic harm reduction. It's going to happen, how can we educate people and minimize the cost to our society? It's not saying prostitution's good, it's just pragmatic. So, in much of Europe, and it's difficult to talk about Europe in broad sweeps because every country's got its own rules, but in most of Europe, brothels are legal. And prostitutes are unionized, and they can't have their license unless they're checked by a nurse or a doctor so they're not spreading diseases and they're routinely checked. And the notion is they run a small business there, it's all together in an area that's zoned for that. And when a prostitute has a dangerous customer and she pushes her emergency button, a pimp does not come to her rescue, but a policeman does. That's just, it doesn't work quite that easy, but that's the ideal and that's what they're shooting for. Whereas in the United States, we treat it probably quite a bit differently. One way, any way you cut it, it's a great tourist attraction. <laughs> <laughs> I was in a uh, Starbucks in Zurich, in Switzerland a little while ago, I went downstairs to the toilet, and I stepped into the room and blue lights. Blue lights, this is strange. And then I remembered, oh yeah, blue lights. I cannot see my veins. I couldn't shoot up if I wanted to. Very clever thing. If you've got a toilet in your business accessible from the general public and you don't want junkies in there shooting up at all hours, put in blue lights and they'll go somewhere else. For years I've taken my groups around Europe and uh, we go to places like Frankfurt or Switzerland and you see all these junkies, these wasted, scary looking needle addicts. They're just miserable looking people. And my, a lot of my tourists will say, these darn liberal Europeans, they got so many drug addicts. Well, it's not quite that simple. They've got no more than us. I mean, it's about the same, but theirs are still alive and out of jail. Ours die and are in jail or kept up quiet. We lost 18,000 people to heroin overdoses last year in our country, 18,000. Europe lost 8,000. It's a horrible problem on both sides of the Atlantic. In Europe, they deal with it in a pragmatic harm reduction kind of way. Across the street from that coffee shop, I saw a machine bolted to the railing over the river that used to sell cigarettes. Now it sells government subsidized syringes, almost free. And in Switzerland, it's just a slam dunk. You got needle addicts, they're gonna be sharing ne needles, their, 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 their lives are a mess. Do you want them all to have AIDS and HIV? No, you give them syringes, you know? That's a European approach. Of course, the moralistic American approach was, no, that would be condoning it, you see. Now, again, I'm just reporting here, but it's interesting that Europeans are dealing with the same problems we are 
with a different sort of approach. And they prefer their approach. Now, down the street from this place, in a little side street, where it's not so public, there's a government-subsidized heroin maintenance clinic. It's called Cafe Fix. All right? And this is where heroin addicts get their addictions administered. You got nurses, you got counselors, you got, you got job counseling, you got a club, you got a community, you got help to get these people back on their feet. And they don't have the terror of where am I going to top up my addiction. They don't have to buy it from people on the streets who might forget to cut it and then they die. You see? This is hard stuff. This is at least worth talking about. And Europeans talk about it. And we don't talk about it quite as much. So I just think it's very interesting as a traveler to be tuned into this stuff as well as the Botticellis and the beef eaters and the gondoliers. It sort of confounds the people from the tourist board when I come in with my public television crew and they say, do you want to, we'll take you to the resort. And I say, no, take me to Cafe Fix, you see. Uh, but uh, I just want to kind of experience that in my travels. When you go to much of Europe, you'll find marijuana is about as exciting as a can of beer, you know. Uh, it's been 25 years since they arrested a pot smoker in the Netherlands. And 25 years later, they're glad they got it this way. Use has not gone up. A lot of Americans really worry that there's a whole reservoir of people that would love to ruin their lives smoking pot if only it was legal. <laughs> Hello. Anybody who wants to smoke pot does. They just have to do it as criminals. This is what they found out in Europe, is that use does not go up when you change the laws. There would be a spike of curious people and then it would settle back down. In Portugal, it's been 10 years since they arrested, or 10 years since they legalized the consumption of all drugs, hard and soft. Drugs are legal for consumers. And 10 years later, even the people who were opposed to that realized this is smart. Use did not go up. They take the crime and the money and the violence out of it, and they treat the problem, which is a real problem, as an education challenge and a health challenge, and the authorities now have credibility. Some Americans say, well, marijuana is a gateway drug. One token, you're on the way to addiction to heroin. And the Europeans have found the only thing gateway about marijuana is its illegality, because the only place to get it then is from criminals in the street who have a vested interest in selling you something more expensive, more profitable, and more addictive. So it's interesting stuff, and I like to get into it because I think it's a, a, a real problem in our society, and it's a difficult problem, like alcohol was during Prohibition. When they finally legalized alcohol, nobody was saying booze is good. They just recognized the law was causing more pain to society than the drug abuse itself. Drugs are bad. Drugs are not healthy. Drugs are addictive. They're not for kids. If somebody's drinking and driving or drinking and smoking, they should throw the book at you, you know? But it doesn't mean you've got to lock up 80,000 people like we have today in jail. It doesn't mean you have to arrest 800,000 people every year like we do. We arrested 800,000 people this last year, more than ever, for having marijuana, just for possession. These weren't rich white guys. These are poor people and these are black people. That's why the NAACP has finally realized drugs are a scourge, but the laws against the drugs are even worse for their community. So it's an interesting issue. That's why I've been a member of Normal for 10 years. That's why I'm co-sponsoring this bill that you might hear about next year, because we're going to try to uh, make marijuana not just available for everybody. It's not pro-drugs. It's the best way to control a dangerous substance is to regulate it and tax it. That's what sophisticated people in this discussion believe. Uh, we're, we're well, we've, we've got 280,000 signatures. We just need 240,000, but there's a lot of bogus signatures, so we're still getting a few more. Uh, it'll be on the ballot next year, and then we'll all vote on it. And uh, we stand to be the first state in the country to treat marijuana like hard liquor, basically. So it's a complicated issue, but um, please, if you're curious about it, don't just take a simplistic bumper sticker approach to it. You can Google Rick Steves and marijuana and learn more than you ever wanted to know about this <laughs> subject. <laughs> and in Europe, it's interesting because they handle it differently. What I know about this is mostly from police and judges and doctors and professors who have been in this for a long time. When you study the differences between cultures, I just think it's fascinating and I really like comparing America and Europe because we're so similar and we've got some fundamental differences. We're both affluent, Christian, love our capitalism, love our democracy, love our freedom. And when I look at it, especially these days with all the discussion going on in our country today with the 99 and stuff, I think in the United States we are government by, for, and of the people, and so is Europe. But on this side of the Atlantic, I think we are government by, for, and of the people via the corporations that we own. <coughs> Not a judgmental thing, I'm just saying, you know, it just makes sense for society to have a government that creates a good environment 
so the corporations can prosper and we can all do great. In Europe, on the other hand, I believe they are government by, for, and of the people in spite of the corporations that they own. In Europe, you're more likely to see a law requiring you to pay for the disposal of your car when you buy it. Not because it's good for business, because it's not good for business. Because it's good for sustainability, because it's honest accounting. That would never happen here with our current sort of situation because people would shoot it down. It's not good for, for that industry. So it's a complicated issue, but it's fun to go to Europe and see how they do things. And if you want to see Europe in the extreme, you go to Scandinavia. And when you see things in the extreme, it's easier to understand the differences. Scandinavia is the least church going, the most affluent, the highest educated, and the most satisfied countries in Europe. They, by every measure, are the most content people in the world. All right? So you can say they're all crazy, but they're happy being crazy. <laughs> now, when you go to Scandinavia, you, 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 you notice the main building right in the center of town is not a big church, but it is a city hall. Reminding me, their religion, and they don't go to church, their religion is humanism. They really care about how they organize their society. And you'd have a big building like this, the city hall in Oslo, with a nave so people can gather with a pulpit, a lectern rather than a pulpit, and with glorious mosaic images on the wall, celebrating not Bible stories, but celebrating heroic individuals who contributed mightily to their society. It's humanism, almost as a religion. It's fascinating. And it's fun to talk to Scandinavia. It's fun to talk to people all over Europe and find out what makes them tick. I've got a lot of sounding boards. Ollie's a friend of mine who's a school teacher in the Swiss Alps, high in a conservative little village where everybody speaks this, has the same last name. It's a very, very remote part of Switzerland. And I get to talk to Ollie and his family. And a little while ago, I asked Ollie, Ollie, how can you Swiss people so docilely pay such high taxes? And without missing a beat, he just said, well, what's it worth to live in a country where there's no hunger, no homelessness, and where everybody, regardless of the wealth of their parents, has access to quality health care and education? It was just matter of fact. He wasn't any crusader. He's not considered a liberal at all in his village. He's quite crusty and conservative. But that's just the sort of the starting point in an affluent society that wants to have that kind of level of decency. Uh, there's enough money to cut some slack to the people who are not doing well and still have that... Darwinian survival of the fittest thing going on that makes us all work really hard. Um, it's fascinating to talk to Europeans and you realize that we Americans are really compassionate, loving people, but one thing we're not great at is dealing with the gap between rich and poor. We, we are awkward with this, and I think part of it's because of our Cold War heritage. We just cannot see things in terms of class warfare. It's not allowed. It's just not allowed. And when you go to the rest of the world, you find out there's a huge gap between rich and poor. There's a gap in our country between rich and, our, and poor, and, uh, it's, which is quite astounding. It's a third world style gap in our country, whether we want to admit it or not. And then the gap between the wealthy world and the have-nots is growing pretty dramatically. When you do travel, you've got it reaching into your window. Ever since I've been a kid, I've had poor people reaching in my window. And it's pretty apparent to me, half of humanity is trying to live on $2 a day. It's clear to me because I've been out there. The average lot in life for women on this planet is to spend many hours a day walking for water. They don't get a manicure and a pedicure. They don't get to go to a doctor and complain about selection of doctors. Once, a, once, twice a month, they get a doctor visiting their village and they take it, you know? And uh, it's a difficult world out there. And when you travel and when you think about it, you realize even if you're motivated only by greed, if you know what's good for you, you don't want to be filthy rich in a desperately poor world. It's just not a nice place to raise your kids. You see it when you travel. You see it in Central America. In Central America, any middle class neighborhood has to pool its money to hire an armed guard to stand on the corner and keep the angry poor kids away so your kids can get outside. It's coming our way. It's coming our way in a hurry. I was just driving from, I think it was Dallas, out to Plano in Texas past 10 miles of fortified front yards. Literally chicken wire retrofitted over the front yard so those kids could get outside and get some fresh air and not be endangered by all the poor kids. You know, that's just a reality. And it, we don't have to have that. You know, Europe doesn't have that because they tax people a little bit. I mean, it's just a price you pay for that kind of a world from a European point of view. And I just don't like the specter of raising your kids behind designer fortifications, which is the norm in most of the world. And when I've traveled, I've really realized these little girls are just as precious as my little girl. 
It's such a beautiful thing to realize. It's not painful, it's a celebration. This world is filled with joy. It's filled with potential. It's filled with deserving children. We're so quick to say, what about the children, you know? Well, what about the children? My girls got $5,000 for straight teeth and money left over for whitener. And I noticed every kid in her class has the wherewithal to scrape together 5,000 bucks for straight teeth and money left over for whitener. And that's right. I work hard, we have a winning system, my girl gets straight teeth, that's no problem. But that doesn't neglect the fact that for the average little girl on this planet, they just wish they had a mom at home to feed them because she's out walking for water. And for the cost of two sets of braces, you could drill a well in that little town and the mom could stay home and love their kids. That's not a guilt trip, that's, a, that's an opportunity, if you ask me. And if you're really interested in national security, I would challenge you to think about soft power as well as hard power. Because for 10,000 bucks, you could drill a well in a town, all the moms could stay home, and instead of walking across the county every morning, they could walk across the street. And then when they pumped that water, and drinking water came out of it, they'd think, God bless America. <laughs> that's what they'd think. And that's pretty powerful stuff. Or you could take a uh, hundred of them, villages, and take that money and put one soldier in Afghanistan for one year. A million dollars, you see. It's just a choice we make. Now, of course, the wells are gonna do more for our national security and our well-being, and not to mention help a lot of beautiful people than one soldier in Afghanistan. But it's not gonna happen. Because nobody here makes money when you drill a well there for 10,000 bucks. And somebody here makes lots of money when you spend a million dollars to keep a soldier in Afghanistan. I think that's the ugly truth. And that's what we just won't talk about as we deal with our budget crisis. We are confronted with by pretty, some pretty complex and unprecedented challenges in our day and age. We've got the reality of angry Islam. We've got climate change. We've got the gap between rich and poor. And we've got a lot of hope. There's a lot of opportunity. And it's exciting when we think about how we're going to deal with this. When I think about how we're going to deal with it, it's, it's shaped by our worldview. And our worldview is shaped by a whole grab bag of different influences. Everybody here has got a different worldview because we have a different life experience. A big part of my worldview, obviously, is a lot of travel. I've spent a lot of time overseas, and the value of that's nothing new. 1,500 years ago, Mohammed said, don't tell me how educated you are. Tell me how much you've traveled. Thomas Jefferson traveled, and he wrote that travel makes a person wiser if less happy. Mark Twain traveled, and he wrote that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. <laughs> and I've traveled a lot, and I'll tell you, it is such a joy to be able to celebrate rather than fear the diversity on this planet. Let me just finish with a little trip to Turkey here. I was, a, as a tour guide, taking a group to the east of Turkey, and my group was curious about the whirling dervishes, so I wanted to find them a dervish so they could see him whirl. And I found a guy who was a dervish, and I said, can my group watch you pray? And he said, I'm not a photo op. You can watch me pray, but you've got to understand what I'm doing. And I said, that's cool. So, and I'll just paraphrase here to simplify it. But, um, so we gathered with him as the sun was setting, went up onto his rooftop, he was all dressed up like a, a dervish. And he said, I'm a follower of Mevlana. He's sort of the prophet of love in my religion, kind of like St. Francis is in yours. Easy to get your brain around St. Francis, easy to get your brain around Mevlana. Five times a day I meditate on the teachings of Mevlana. I dress up like my monk's outfit. I plant one foot in my hometown, my family, my community. The other foot goes around acknowledging the beautiful variety on this planet of God's great creation. All the variety. One hand goes up and accepts the love of our maker, our creator, our God. The other hand goes down like the spout of a tea kettle, showering God's love on his creation. The beautiful variety, my home, my family, my community. And five times a day he whirls and he gets himself into a meditative trance. And we were there witnessing that. His head tilted over, his robe billowed out. I looked at him, lost in that thought, being a conduit between God's love and his world. And I looked at the eyes and the faces of my tourists, taking that in. And all of a sudden, this guy was no longer so freaky and scary. He's different, sure. But fundamentally, we're all together. <laughs> and to go home with that understanding, and then to implement that in the way we live out our lives here as citizens of this great country, 
It's a beautiful, powerful thing. And that's to me the most important souvenir. And when we live that out here as citizens of the planet as well as thankful Americans, I think that is making travel a political act. And that's something I love to come to Spokane and talk about. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.